All right, amen, and thankful for uh, the victor, the captain of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. On this Independence Day, uh, I don't know if it's become a tradition or not, but I'd like to make it a, a, a heartfelt habit of reminding ourselves of the greatest privilege uh, that any nation has ever enjoyed on earth and why it's so precious. Uh, wonderful that we have political freedom to elect our leaders, wonderful that we have economic freedom uh, to save and spend and earn as we will, minus the property and gas and milk and income taxes. Uh, all those things are great, and freedom of travel between, between and among the states. Our greatest liberty that uh, no other nation before, or I believe since, enjoys is that of religious freedom, religious liberty. And the greatest treaties, most profound and concise treaties on American religious liberty comes from an English pastor, John Wesley, uh, who came to the United States, southern United States in Georgia, the Savannah area, traveled extensively with his brother Charles, kind of in a sense got the ball rolling for revival. George Whitfield also came from England, uh, preached revival messages, and later uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, one of our native-born sons, uh, basically ushered in the American Revolution through their preaching. So in a sense, John Wesley was instrumental in stirring up the people's hearts and getting uh, the American Revolution, uh, getting, the, getting the fire stoked, and then looking from across the ocean and seeing the result of his work, he wrote this to the Methodist Church in Baltimore. Uh, this is called the Christmas Conference in 1784, and uh, this was a letter that was sent to consecrate bishops Asbury and Coke to the ordained and sacramental ministry of the Methodist Church in the United States. And along the way, John Wesley iterates the most beautiful words ever spoken regarding our religious liberty. It says, uh, I'll just read the, the first and the last sentences. By a very uncommon train of providences, many of the provinces of North America are totally disjoined from their mother country and erected into independent states. The English government has no authority over them, either civil or ecclesiastical, that is religious, because the Church of England was uh, the, the king or queen of England as the overseer of the church. Uh, and so he said that the English government has no authority over them, either civil or ecclesiastical. And he concludes this way. As our American brethren are now totally disentangled, both from the state and from the English hierarchy, we dare not entangle them again, either with the one or the other. They are now at full liberty simply to follow the scriptures and the primitive church. And we judge it best that they should stand fast in that liberty wherewith God has so strangely made them free. Now I love this because this is a man who is loyal to his country, loyal to his people, and loyal to his crown. He opposed the American Revolution and he stood with uh, his countrymen who went across the ocean to fight on American soil. However, at the conclusion of that battle, as the man who uh, had a large role to play in stirring up the American Revolution, unbeknownst to himself, looked across the ocean, past the setting sun, and saw the results of that American Revolution, he said, this is an opportunity, this is a privilege, this is a freedom that no Christians in history have ever enjoyed. Now, American brothers and sisters, go get it. Stand fast in it, preach in it, gather in it, worship in it, enjoy it, but most importantly, use it. And so I pray that you and I, even under the elation and thanksgiving for our religious liberty, are convicted that, as our brother John Wesley said, that we would stand fast in that liberty. That doesn't mean to stand still and do nothing. That means go out and use that liberty to our brother's good and to God's glory. And so I pray this week in a public place you've shared the love and grace of Jesus Christ with someone verbally and or with actions and or preferably both. 
I pray that it, in, uh, in public forums you have spoken about your faith and what Jesus Christ has done for you. And I pray that in gatherings like this, you not, uh, not sheepishly, not half-heartedly, but, but all in with everything you got, praise and extol the God of heaven, who among many other things, in addition to purchasing our salvation with his precious blood, in addition to giving us enough food to eat today, in addition to giving us clothes to put on our backs and cars to come to the drive-in service and, bless God, air conditioners that blow cold air over us, in addition to all that, gave us religious liberty that no people before or I believe after have ever or will ever enjoy. Let's go get it. And as I said, if an Englishman loyal to the British crown can, can say that and see that, you and I have no excuse to miss it. Okay, we're going to, unless, uh, unless something comes up in the next week or God uh, arrests my attention to something at the end of the book of Joshua, we're going to conclude in the book of Joshua this week. And as John Wesley said that the Americans are now free to follow the scriptures and the primitive church, there is no better description of the primitive church given anywhere in Scripture than the book of Acts. And so that is where we will be going next. I believe that this time of coronavirus and uh, uncertainty and having to change the way we do things uh, has hopefully roused in us a desire and a, and a longing for the primitive church of our fathers where uh, Paul had to rent a meeting hall in Ephesus in order to have services. And in Jerusalem, they wait till all the faithful Jewish worshipers had left the synagogue so that they could then go in and have a Christian service. And so uh, just asking that, uh, that God would take us back to that place where, where all you need is a couple of working feet and a mouth to get the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. In, Act, in uh, Joshua chapter 23 and verse 16, Joshua uh, challenges the people this way, warns them this way, if you will, encourages and stirs them up this way. Joshua chapter 23 and verse 16. When ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. Now that's not an if, that's a when. When ye have transgressed the covenant, then... His anger shall be kindled against you, and you shall carry quickly from off the good land which he hath given you. And then continuing in chapter 24 and verse 14, I'll read some verses uh, after that. Chapter 24 and verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up out of, and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, in which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people. And then it says uh, in verse 19, Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God and will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good and the people said unto joshua nay but we will serve the lord and joshua said unto the people ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the lord to serve him and they said we are witnesses and verse 26 and joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of god and and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the lord and joshua said unto all the people Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. 
Not if, but when we transgress, God's anger will be kindled and he will turn against. And then he says in verse 27, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest you deny your God. You know, this, this whole thing about the Bible racing headlong, light years beyond what modern science has come up with. Joshua said that stone would be a witness unto them. It was as if their words were heard and recorded and available for playback on that stone. Well, that sounds hilarious. A stone is a dead and inanimate object. However, when I was growing up, we had these little things that you played music and recordings on called cassette tapes. And before that, my parents and and people a little bit older had eight track tapes. And they were these uh, uh, tapes that were loaded with ferrite crystal that you would run through a recording machine to pick up music and vocals, and then you would run later on through a playback machine to play those recorded music and vocals. Stones on a tape bearing witness and, 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 and playing that witness at a later date. Uh, so the Bible's way ahead of science. It always has been. It always will be. And if you want to bring it up more to modern times, uh, they can now, using uh, laser technology, catch minute, almost indiscernible vibrations in wall studs, in, in furniture, in floors, in ceilings, in homes. And they can, through those vibrations, determine how long ago a conversation took place that is still vibrating in that material and they can pick up uh, a little muddy but you can discern what was said many many years ago uh, so those uh, talking stones uh, those uh, talking stones and talking timbers are as up to date as anything else and God's word recorded it 3,000 years ago now Joshua said not if but when and he tried twice to dissuade the people. He said, okay, you can serve the Egyptian gods, you can serve the Amorite gods, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then the people said, far be it from us to serve other gods, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, no, you cannot serve the Lord. And the people said, yes, but we will serve the Lord. He tried to, to, to warn them about what they were getting into if they said and meant wholeheartedly, we will serve the Lord. And I believe with all my heart that they meant it with all their heart. I don't think they were hypocritical. I don't think they had uh, false motives or false intentions. I don't think they were deceitful towards Joshua or towards themselves or to the Lord. I think when they said, we will serve the Lord, they meant we will serve the Lord, and they meant it with everything they had. Well, if you turn the page from Joshua chapter 24, you'll see in Judges chapter 1 and following that it didn't take just the, the death of Joshua and the elders of that time before the whole thing fell into chaos and calamity. And people who swore up and down and promised and said, yes, this stone will be a witness, and we will be witnesses against ourselves, and we really mean it, honest, were, were turning and serving foreign and strange gods that they said they never would, and turning from the living God, whom they said with all their heart, we will serve. Well, guess what? We're no different. We're not, we're, we are not in any way uh, exempt from, from that premise or that downfall. And what happens with us, even though we have the holy word of God for which people have bled and died and been thrown in prison over the centuries in our laps, and we read it, and I'm, I'm thankful for our Bible reading uh, project this year, the Bible reading challenge, and and, and if you haven't been inside of the sanctuary, look at how that sword's been filled up by all our faithful uh, Christian brothers and sisters in this local church community who are reading through God's Word. What a privilege and a blessing. We have that. Moreover, what the Israelites didn't have that we do is we have the very and Holy Spirit of God living inside us to guide us into all truth and to convince us of sin and righteousness and judgment. And we have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by that Holy Spirit but guess what? 10, 15 minutes after the service ends, most if not all of us are liable to be turning and serving strange gods. And, and so we're not exempt. We don't need to, to look back and say, wow, I'm glad I'm not like that because you and I are exactly like that. In fact, we have greater advantages than they did and we're still like that. Uh, so what we need to do 
is we need to admit the fact that we still have an old man living in us that is bent on the gods of Egypt, that is bent on the gods of the Amorites, that is bent on turning from the true and living God of heaven and turning to the false and lesser and, and wicked uh, gods that the world has to offer. And what we need to do is say, okay, Lord, how do I learn from what the Israelites went through? When they, as it were, came down to that mourner's bench and came down to the altar and the choir was singing, Just As I Am, and the preacher said, Oh, you don't want to serve God. And they, ran, they didn't walk. They, they, they ran across the pews to get down front and said, We will serve God. And, and bless God, I believe anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is saved and will always be saved and is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and can no more cease to become a child of God than anyone here's children can cease to become your children as much as you might wish they could from time to time. They are still your children. It's, they've been born and they can't be unborn. I believe that with all my heart. But you and I can, can turn and serve some strange and foreign and wicked gods if we're not careful to learn from the Israelites' example and, and if we're not careful to, to, uh, to acknowledge that we're not exempt from what they went through. Our hearts can be changed and our minds can be twisted and, and our desires can be turned the wrong direction just like theirs were. And we can come down and we can mean it with all our heart when we get saved and we can say at that time, I am saved, I'm forgiven, my sins are gone, I'm on my way to heaven, I'm no longer a citizen of hell, I'm no longer a son of the devil, I'm now a child of God with, a, with an eternal inheritance in Christ, and I'm going to serve Him wholeheartedly the rest of my life. And we can know that in a day, or a week, or a year, or even an hour from making that decision, that we are going to be tempted, and sometimes, not if, but when, fall in that temptation and turn to some foreign and some strange gods. And it says at that time that the Lord's anger will be kindled and he will turn against us. Now the question is then asked, if, if this can happen to me in the promised land, and I pray, I, I have, a not, I have not uh, conquered and taken possession of all the land God has for me. I'm, I'm certain of that now as I'm standing before you. But during this study, during this time, this opportunity that God has made available to you and me, I have taken some ground in my faith and in my life, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. I pray that's the case uh, for many, if not all of us gathered here today. But when you do that, there is a possibility that God, you may do something or turn a, a, a wrong way where God gets angry with you and makes you his enemy and then delivers you into the uh, hands of the Egyptians, the hand of the Amorites. And the question is, why should I bother? If I was already in Egypt, and yes, I was a slave, and yes, I had to get my own straw, and yes, I had to make more bricks uh, than is humanly possible, but at night I had a pot of meat waiting for me. Or yes, I was in the wilderness, and I wandered around aimlessly, and the enemies were over our, our shoulders, and the sun was beating down hard on us, but I had my bread given to me every morning. I had quail for meat given to me every night. My shoes never wore out. My garments never wore out. Why should I bother crossing into the promised land if there's a chance that I could lose it? And the answer is, as we said at the outset, the promised land is the only place where I can experience fruitfulness in my life. I can be a child of God. I can be led of God and, and, and just wandering around in circles in the wilderness, just basically riding this life out to get to something better, or I can enjoy the trip. And the only place where you and I can actually enjoy being children of God, enjoy being Christians, and have something to show for our time here on earth is in the promised land. So that's why that's the answer to why I take the risk, because that's the only place there's ever a reward is in the promised land. Now, you know, the uh, wonderful, if apples, uh, an apple tree, I should say, is broad and thick foliated and gives good shade. I would like an apple tree to be over me right now. That would be wonderful. Uh, but an apple tree's job is not to be a shade tree. It's to produce fruit. And so uh, if you're ever up in New Paris at the top of that ridge where, where Boyers and, and uh, Ridge Top and the other growers uh, have their orchards, you will see that at the end of the season, they hack those trees back mercilessly. I mean, they take them almost back to the trunk. Some of them they have trained to run like uh, grapevines uh, along, uh, along wires, like uh, I forget, spalier or whatever you call that kind of 
but, but they, they are mean to those trees. And Jesus gave an example. He gave a parable in the New Testament, and he said when God comes into his vineyard and he finds a tree that's not producing fruit, he is going to prune it heavy. Ouch. And then he's going to dig around the roots. Ouch, that makes me look like I'm losing my foundation. Makes me feel like I'm, uh, like I might uh, be be completely out, you know, uprooted. And then third, it says he dungs around the roots. Now some of your Bibles are nice and they're polite and they say fertilizer, but dung and fertilizer are the same thing. That means that he's going to bring something into my life that stinks. He's going to bring something into my life that's revolting, something into my life that I would rather not be around in order to get to, to produce the result that he wants in my life, and that is to bear fruit. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit, and so the internal fruit, the fruitfulness in my life that I can bear uh, without anyone else's help is to have the uh, love, joy, peace, kindness, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. I can live in a land of fruitfulness by bearing the fruit of the Spirit, and that happens in the promised land. And then secondly, I am supposed to replicate the faith that exists in me in other people. The Apostle Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, and said that I know that your mother and your grandmother taught you the scriptures uh, from your youth and that their faith now lives in you. That means my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through my sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ can go and live in someone else and they can be saved and they can be born again and they can be translated from death to life and they can have a destiny with God instead of in a, in a lake of fire. And that's, uh, so God wants two things. He wants us to look like Christ through bearing the fruit of the Spirit and he wants us to make other Christians by being fruitful. And that can only happen in the promised land. So here's what happens. We have a decision to make. Do you even want to cross that river? Where do you want to stay in the wilderness? God's providing for you in the wilderness. You've got some uh, some little extra money in the wilderness, not a whole lot, but some. You've got some entertainment and some fun things. You and your, your family are having a good time together. You got your shopping trips. You got your car that you drive. You have all your provisions met, yet there's no joy, yet there's not peace, yet there's little to no love, yet uh, your, your flesh and the world and the devil conspire and choke the life out of anything that seems like it's going to bear fruit in your life when you're in the wilderness. But if you take that chance and follow the ark, that's the praise and worship and word of God and, and salvation of God, and you follow that ark into the, wilder, or into the promised land, then you've got some new enemies, and you've got some new cities to defeat, then you've got some giants, uh, then you've got some well-fortified uh, uh, soldiers to oppose, but you can start enjoying the journey, and you can start being filled. How many people like to be filled with the peace of God? Well, ironically, the peace of God only comes from going to the promised land and doing battle. How many people would love to be filled with the love of God? Well, ironically, the love of God only comes when we hate sin and uh, only hate the things that oppose God's word. Uh, how many people would love to be filled with patience? Ironically, patience only comes from enduring things that require patience to endure. So, uh, so you get to that promised land, and now you've got a new set of troubles, but what you get in return is a new set of blessing. You get rewards. You get fruitfulness. You get the, the abundant life of God. And then he says, stick with it. You have pushed to the borders. You've conquered the enemies. You've driven out the inhabitants. Now you've made leagues and packs with some of the people, and that's going to come back later to bite you. But for the most part, you've been faithful and obedient to God. You've taken the land. You've done what he commanded, and now you're going to enjoy it. But what you need to do is you need to chasten yourself, and you need to uh, straighten yourself, and you need to judge yourself so that God doesn't have to turn and judge you. In Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about the misery of being chastened of God. It says, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Now, how many of us that got a good backside paddling from our parents can say it was not joyous at the time? It, the scripture goes on to say then that nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So if God's coming into my life and he's, he's giving me a good whipping, or he's pruning me back hard, the branches to the trunk, or he's digging up around my foundation and my roots, and he's pouring in what I consider to be stinky, smelly, and undesirable stuff that actually turns out to be fertilizer, it says on the back end what that produces is the image of Christ in me and the ability to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and bear fruit for his kingdom. So 
Joshua said, make that decision now. Uh, you go ahead and serve the gods of the Egyptians. You go ahead and serve the gods of the Ammonites. You go ahead and serve Baal and Moloch and, and Ashtoreth. Have, have at it. But if you're going to make this decision to serve the Lord, you need to know what you're getting into. And that's why he tried to talk them out of it. It's one thing to receive the Lord Jesus Christ for the saving of your soul. Amen. It's simple. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. I cannot add or subtract anything from the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, wonderful. I've trusted him. Now I'm born again and saved. But he said, if you're going to serve me, it's going to cost you everything. So make sure you know what you're getting into. Make sure you know what the risks are. And finally, not if, but when you and I fall, make sure we know where the restoration comes from. That comes from sometimes difficulty in our lives. I'll tell you, the greatest things that have been produced in our nation's history have been times where we were going through the most difficult and turbulent times in our history. One quick example is who we now call the greatest generation. People who would have been born at the beginning of the Roaring Twenties and, uh, and their youth would have been maybe uh, consumed to some extent with the fight for prohibition and the banning of the sale of alcohol in the United States. And then uh, it, 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 as they were coming of age to where they could actually think for themselves and, and actually kind of observe the world around them, they would have become face to face with Black Tuesday and the Great Depression. And then, just when it seemed like the country was turning around and, and like maybe they had a, a little bit of hope and could get a little traction for their adulthood, they got shipped over to Germany and uh, Northern Africa and Japan to fight in a war. Now, all that trouble then produced whom you and I today, uh, most people agree and celebrate as the greatest generation. The uh, American Revolution produced the first Great Awakening, or I should say the First Great Awakening produced the American Revolution. And likewise, uh, simultaneously, the Second Great Awakening and the fight to uh, the, the war between the states to end slavery on the, soil, on the United States soil uh, came together. And then uh, we had World War I and revival accompanied it. And then we had World War II and revival accompanied it. And there was even a smaller revival that produced some of the greatest preachers that have ever stood on American soil associated with the Vietnam War. You had your Oliver Greens and your Lester Roloffs and your Jack Hiles uh, all, all uh, uh, bringing people to Christ during that time. And so God uses those times of difficulty, those times of, uh, when things are over our head and beyond our control to press us further into Him. And so what I pray for you and I is not if, as Joshua said, but when we find ourselves turning and serving strange gods that we might then turn to God and say, I'm a miss, I'm out of your will, I'm disobeying you, I'm dishonoring you, I'm bringing hurt, hurt to myself and the people around me. God, I want to run closer and hide from you in you. And that's the benefit and the blessing that the Christians have been given. We don't have to bring sacrifices, but the sacrifice of praise. So we don't have bullocks to offer, we don't have goats and lambs to offer, uh, we don't have turtle doves to offer. We have the sacrifice of praise, a broken and contrite spirit, and 1 John 5 says, uh, sorry, 1 John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the greatest paradox of the Christian life is that I am hid from the wrath and judgment and justice of God in the love, grace, mercy, and blood of God's only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So in order to escape God's wrath, you and I run and hide deeper in His Son. How many people want to have a Heavenly Father that instead of running from when you've disobeyed, you run to and say, can you help me get right? And how many people want a Heavenly Father that instead of having to track them down and tell them what they've done wrong and how much of it, that we can go to Him and acknowledge our sin and have him, instead of beating us, pick us up, dust us off, and say, the just man falleth seven times and riseth again. Let's get you back up and on your way. I love that you recognized your sin. I love that you confessed your sin. And I want you to continue serving me the way you promised to serve me so many years ago. I'll invite our singers and musicians to lead us in a final hymn of praise. <laughs> 